want to introduce yourselves briefly? Uh, hi everyone, I'm Sophie. I'm a math student in sociology and my research interest is... Um, a little louder? Yeah, my research interest is immigration attitudes of the people in receiving society. Right. Yeah. You want to add another, another sentence or two? Just, uh, oh. Just background? Uh, okay, so... Um, like that. I was born and raised in China where I spent most, most of my life and got a bachelor in communication studies and then I just came here and decided to pursue a degree in sociology. Okay, okay. Very good. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Marcos. Uh, I'm from Argentina. Um, I have a BA in political science uh, and now through the uh, MAPS program, uh, the Master of Arts program in social sciences and now shifting towards geographic information science. Um, so my current interests actually overlap the two. I'm interested in spatial patterns in voting, electoral outcomes. So yeah, uh, feel free to reach out, uh, send me an email if you have an issue with the course. Uh, yeah. Okay. We will add their full names and emails can we add your phone? Yes, yeah, th thank you. You both sent me that. We will update that on the on the syllabus for yeah. Why don't you for now? Why don't you just 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 put your names and uh, emails on the board maybe? That, then they'll they'll see the the name written out, which is helpful. Um, okay. Um, let's push on. We've got some a couple of new a new points I want to add. Extending what we did last time in. Backwards and forwards. <coughs> Backwards, um, historically, um, the, the why do we have, the big question I'll ask and then we'll go forward and back. Why do we have this disconnect between the global and the local? There are many answers to it. We've sketched a few. <coughs> um, and we often discuss it now in the names of people, Adorno doesn't, and so forth. Um, why? A little bit more. And I'm going to fill in some pieces which are so which have seldom been joined before, including in this course. I didn't I didn't have these these specific points. I just put them together. Um, <coughs> In this course, this section features especially Adam Smith and the contrast with Marx and then Sassen who tries to join these two. And we see in the conflicts within Sassen, the conflicts between Marx and Smith. And let me bring out another one which has seldom been explicitly discussed in certainly more general terms. Adam Smith divided society into three, three great classes. Landlords, workers, and capitalists. And what? So the one I'm going to put here, I'll just I'll just add one. Is the landlords, the workers, and the, and the capitalists. This was based on a theory of the distribution of the proceeds of labor that make up national wealth the total goods and services produced in a given nation, now measured by GNP, which I talked about, the equivalents measured for the first time. The wealth can go to profits, to wages, or to rents, in the case of these three classes. Profits, wages, or rents. Profits are the proceeds of capital. Wages are the proceeds of labor. And rents are the proceeds of land the three classic factors of production as discussed by, by Alfred Marshall, uh, to whom we return, and then Joseph Schumpeter added a fourth, discussed uh, such as entrepreneurship or innovation. Okay, so three classes, three kinds of, re of revenues that were here in Adam Smith. Marx, built on Smith and Ricardo in detail in years. He spent his major work with in the British Museum called Capital, Das Kapital. In the first two major volumes, which were completed and published, there is nothing on landlords. And 
their, and their rent. The third volume has a little bit, but it's not really developed, and Engels did a little bit of work on it, but the, the basic point is it's, 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 it's omitted from the core of Marxist analysis. Only in the 1930s, sorry, yeah, okay, here we go. Only in the 1930s was earlier work by Marx discovered and published and as, a, as a book which has become famous called The Economic and Political Manuscripts of 1844. Okay. Economic and Political Manuscripts of 1844. When I was in college, I had a, I had a philosophy course. And they had, they, and because there was a philosopher who edited a book on this and basically said this transforms our view of alienation in the modern world, of the linkages between the individual and society and so forth. So it had, it had, it had a big impact because, I mean, because Marx was a student of whom? Who did he study with at the University of Berlin? Hegel. Hegel. Okay. Was Hegel? Okay, so some people have called Marx an historical materialist. However, that term was not used by Marx, it was used, was used by Engels. But nevertheless, other things talk about, say, substructure and superstructure of the, as a relationship between ideas and, and, and material. Uh, <coughs> This was a, a big issue between Hegel and when Marx graduated, finished his studies in Berlin, he joined initially many of the other students of Hegel and studied what? Religion. Because religion was the quintessential core of the ideas, the ethos, which is what Hegel taught students should study in order to understand the deep roots of historical periods and the transformation over time would be the conflict between the ideas in one period and another period and Hegel discussed then the, <coughs> the thesis, the antithesis as leading to a synthesis of the past conflict between these di between dichotomies. Dichotomies. Hegel looked for one versus the other. Two classes, not three. Adam Smith was not a student of Hegel. He didn't know about you have to have two classes to explain history, and so Adam Smith had three. Marx struggled with this when he was working on religion, when he was reading and thinking about Hegel, and he was thinking about politics and in transforming the world and all of this stuff, and he wrote a book called The Economic Media. You know, he had a draft, not, not, never published, but it was discovered in, 19, in roughly 1937, something like that. <laughs> what, did he, what did Marx say in this economic and philosophical manuscripts about, about landlords. Quite a bit. The contradiction between landlord and capitalist is extremely bitter and each side gives the truth about the other. Okay, so he doesn't say superstructure, substructure. He doesn't say one is right and one is wrong. He's struggling himself. He's quoting them rather than telling, rather than using the label which he used later on when he would discuss, for instance, the Irish workers fighting against the English workers rather than joining with them against capitalists. And the famous concept which he introduced then was False consciousness. Okay, so that implied that is my point of this is that hate is that Marx did not ignore 
culture. He did not ignore ideas. He took them seriously enough to castigate those Irish workers who did not join, and he called it, and another core concept for him was class consciousness. That in order for history to progress, you had to have conflict between two classes to drive it ahead, and the conflict was often framed in terms of ideas, which could articulate interests. Uh, <clears throat> Continuing Marx, one need only read the, the attacks on immovable or on unmovable property and vice versa to get a clear picture of their respective worthlessness. The landowner lays stress on the noble lineage of his property, on feudal mementos, reminiscences, the poetry of recollections, on his romantic disposition, on his political importance, etc. And when he talks economics, it is only agriculture that he holds to be productive. At the same time, he depicts his adversary as a sly, haggling, deceitful, greedy, mercenary, rebellious, heart and soulless, cheap jack, extorting, pimping, servile, smooth, flattering, fleecing, dried up twister without honor, principles, poetry, importance, substance, or anything else. A person estranged from humanity who freely trades it away and who breeds, sorry, I missed the word that because that, that's important here, freed from community, local, and who trades it away and who breathes, nourishes, and cherishes competition with its paupers, crime, and the dissolution of all social bonds. Okay, I'll stop there. You get the flavor. Uh, <coughs> if you've read a little bit of Marx or thought about these issues, Marx tends to use this kind of powerful literary image and language from Shakespeare, from Goethe, in explicitly or implicitly. Because <laughs> he read he read them seriously and he was looking for as well as as, as well as a student of Hegel. <coughs> um, uh, but he used more of the powerful adjectives when he had a weaker theory a weaker way of putting it together logically and coherently. So he did not have something like this in including the landowners. So what did he do? He threw them out, basically, or did not mention them. <laughs> um, okay, is this a simple question of 19th century intellectual history? No. This is going on today. How so? <laughs> if we trace a little, just a little baby bit of history here, when Marxist leaders had to implement these ideas, what did they do? Lenin and Mao uh, both defeated the factions within their countries that said, wait. Others who were given to a reading of what they called scientific socialism, the Marxist theory of history, said that these changes that Marx laid out were inevitable. Marx said they were, so we know he's right. But how long do we have to wait before we have the revolution? Was the big policy question. In Russia around 1913, 15, 17, the Mensheviks, in Russia said, we should wait. We are in peasant society, landloaders and peasants. This is the great majority of the Russian economy. We have a small manufacturing industrial sector. We're not ready for a revolution. Lenin and the Bolshevik faction said, no, we will revolt now because we have, and we will use our force to do so, and Lenin prevailed. Lenin elaborated far more than Marx, 
during this period and, and thereafter, the globalization of capitalism and the international battles that should follow. That is, countries that became communist or socialist should fight internationally against the capitalist countries uh, until, until socialism and communism would prevail. Domestically, however, and, that, and that's better known, but, that, but that, that leads directly to the 1960s and 70s writings on capitalism, Wall Street, and continues today in some of the rhetoric we hear in presidential debates going on uh, in the last few days in the US. Domestically, however, what did this mean? This was where this was very tough. Inside China, inside Russia. Domestically, farmers must become part of the new socialist economy. That is, how could they do this if they were a residue of feudalism? Peasants, sort of to, to transform peasants from a feudal era into a modern socialist society meant for, at least for Lenin and Mao, collectivization. Making farming into a more manufacturing-like, high-tech for the time, advanced, productive, active series of activities. But would it be measured by output divided by input or something like that? No. It would be measured, at least in, in, the, in the way that it worked out, it would be measured by do you join our collective movement or not? And the people, the farmers who did not join went, I won't, I'm simplifying obviously, but some of them went to Siberia, some of them were, were involved in other, I mean, the, 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 I'm not trying to get into the details of history, but the, 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 the simple big number, which is, which is, which you can look up if you want on the web, <coughs> is that there were more, these were the bloodiest conflicts of the 20th century. Far more people were killed under Lenin in Russia, under Mao in China, than were killed by Hitler in the, in the, in the Holocaust. The Holocaust we all know about, and there's huge amounts written and discussed about it, we don't hear much at all about, the, about what happened in these, in, these, in these problems of trying to transform um, agriculture in Russia and China. Even today in the 21st century, to switch now from both from reflection and policy to, to theories, many social scientists and policymakers do not have a coherent image which joins the local with the global. Since land, place, and space have often, in the discussions by many social scientists, sociologists, political scientists, economists, geographers, have, geographers are more, more qualified. They sometimes bring it in, but they don't often discuss this. <coughs> many of them have basically followed the Marxist line, abolishing landowners and farmers, uh, and focusing on capitalism as the, as the um, the, as the frame, as the, as the one, as the key class. <coughs> um, what we seek to do in this course is to, to, is to explicitly restore the local, most explicitly in the book called Scenescapes, especially chapter four, on the economy from Smith to Marx to Marshall, Alfred Marshall to Joseph Schumpeter, the specialists on Marx have noted, I mean, they noted what I've talked about, that Marx dropped out land. But few beyond the specialists have paid attention to this, and they basically follow, have followed Marx in dropping out the local. And, in, and instead, we have many images from Lenin, for instance, of Wall Street and capitalism as Wall Street of the driver, or let's say the World Trade Center is a global version, and therefore an attack on the World Trade Center is a symbolic attack on global capitalism in the mark in the Leninist spirit, um, or Hollywoodization in the spirit of Gramsci, Adorno, Bourdieu, Ritzer. 
And in city streets, which are compared in three cities in China and the Netherlands and the US by Sharon Zukin and her collaborators who basically say they've commodified. They're all the same. There's just global commodification. And commodification was a, a term for Marx implicitly denying localism, which was the bad, the bad memory or the bad historical residue of the landowner. Okay, um, not everyone has agreed with Marx and, and others on this, and I'm, and I'm mentioning some examples by people close to this debate, but, but these, are, these are big issues, and I'm, so I'm, I'll flag a couple of, of other big theories about this, and uh, having flagged the importance of this in terms of the, 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 the deaths of the people involved. <laughs> um, Barrington Moore, as a famous Marxist writer, um, uh, who, who has a book on how and why there was a revolt, why was there a communist revolt, basically, in, um, and why, why did you have more class conflict in China and Russia and less, or, and then medium, let's say more, lots in Russia and China, medium in Germany and Eastern Europe, and much less in England. Uh, and he, he, he sketches out an interpretation where he joins the, the rural landowners with the capitalist urban elite in London. And he points out that in England, more than in the other, than all these other countries of the world, you had through the 19th century, or 18th continuing through the 19th, that is, earlier there were all landowners, but by the, by the 19th century, you had an interpenetration of these two. That is, you did not have a, a clear and separated rural feudal elite, as in, say, East Prussia, or in parts of, of Russia. <coughs> um, but you had intermarriage, but, it, but symbolized, and this is where Barrington Moore interestingly uses culture in the form of novels. He has an appendix, a very, he, he's furious at, the, at what he's writing, but he, he, he's read this stuff in, in great detail. The novels of the 19th century England show you how we would work from Monday through Friday or for a couple of days in London at the bank, at the insurance company, at the stock exchange, and then on the weekend we would go down to Maryside, or that is a small town, a rural area, and the term was then often used in England of the manor, or the manor house. Was this important outside England? Generally not on the continent, but where did it have impact in the United States? Which region that, we, that I've suggested we talk about a little more that, this, that doesn't get enough attention in, at the University of Chicago in general. South. South. So. The South. What was the model of the South? The manor house. The British manor house. And so when they created the initial ships that went to Virginia, to North Carolina, to South Carolina, so forth, they would have, you know, one person who knew how to, who, to put on to put <coughs> um, horseshoes on horses, a barber, you know, people who could cut the cotton, uh, etc. Um, but in, and then in the Southern literature later on, uh, Faulkner most of all, and with most subtlety, but, but in, uh, in the film, which is, um, has been seen by more Swedes than all of Bergman's films combined, um, blocking on the name. Anyway, uh, anyway, it's it's a film of of of, uh, of, of the old and the new South uh, after after 1860. Basically, these are in it. But why do they watch this in Sweden? Because it's not uniquely the South. That is, the American South shares with China, 
and Russia some elements, but more directly it's closer and more explicitly modeled on the manor house, and the American Southerners read the 19th century English novels. They didn't read Chinese or Russian. Okay. <coughs> and, and, and the like. Um, Barrington Moore. Uh, Lipset, Lipset and Rokan have, uh, uh, I still, the leading book used in political science and political sociology to explain class voting and, 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 and really voting more generally. Uh, and uh, they joined together chapters from the, the lead countries around the world which shaped these and differed in terms of certain, so their introduction is the, is the major statement. And their basic introduction says that we need to look at a little bit of history to understand why, say, England is different from, from or, or was and is different from the other countries, uh, <coughs> and why it has less class voting. And the, what, they, what they put together is the period, I mean, they, they put a couple of things together, but, but the, the simple story fits with Barrington Moore. It's the same story. That the British elite joined the rural and the urban and therefore weakened the class conflict which you had in Germany and worse in Russia or China, or more extreme left side. I'm trying to work worse. Uh, <coughs> Um, the uh, in Hig good Hig a um, there's a follow-up book by Alan Silver which is it's called something like blue collar Tories um, or working class Tories which shows that if you compare the proportion of blue collar of manual laborers in Western Europe Germany France Italy Spain with England, that in England the blue collar voters, the, the, manual la the manual laborers, vote more conservative, at least until recently. Last 10 or 20 years, this is this is this is this is changed. But let's say through the 19th and 20th centuries, the the, the manual laborers in England um, voted more conservative than in Germany, France, or elsewhere. Why? And the answer of Lipset and Rokan, building on Barrington Moor, uh, and if you want, you could use this label, they had more false consciousness because the, because the manor house, they were part of the manor house. They were treated well by the local landlords who loved being in the countryside. They felt a local community attachment. And they felt a lifelong commitment and responsibility to the people they lived with locally. And that has persisted over generations. And you can find some of this in the South. I mean, look at, you look at Faulkner. So Faulkner was a Southerner. He, he tried to capture some of these in the relations between African Americans, and black, they were then called blacks and whites, and how they had interpenetrations over generations um, in multiple complicated ways. Jealousy, anger, revenge, making up the loss that someone did to me two generations back. I mean, that's all there in ways that, that is both conflict, love, animosity, jealousy, etc. But it, it is not whole capitalism. Okay, so <coughs> the, um, the, the literary aesthetic side is another theme which we, we're scattered, we'll have it scattered through the course. I, I made it briefly explicit, but I'm using it here to illustrate Marx's own text, uh, Barrington Moore's appendix, Lipset and Rokan's building on them, and Alan Silver's conclusions in terms of numbers of, of, of voters. Just one, one more name along similar lines to make this more global. It's a Janet Abula God. Uh, Arab in background, 
has a book on a thousand years of Cairo. Um, and she's, a, she's an Egyptian um, Middle Eastern specialist, basically. But she, in, her, in her later years, she did a book on New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. And what she did was to bring her perspective as, as a, as a, as, as a, from history in, in saying why are New York and Chicago and, and, and uh, LA so different. And, she, and she, what she comes up with is a strong criticism of Sassen. So Sassen, she, 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 so Abula got basically saying, Sassen is cold, impersonal, she's walked talking about Wall Street in ways that omit what you're more sensitive to if you pay attention to the poetry of nature. I mean, how much, I mean, what are the topics of British poetry, even if you haven't had very much since high school or whatever? Nature and love, okay? Flowers, green trees. I mean, that's, I mean there's a huge amount of that stuff in, in British poetry. The, 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 Brits, the Brits spend more time and money in their gardens. Look at British television in contrast to American. It's filled, you know, one hour. How do you shape the tulips so they're a little more attractive than, than the roses next to them. I mean, they, you know, one hour on that stuff. Amer even Amer Americans have suburban, they have, I mean, America has, we do have a lot of suburban gardeners who do a bit of this, but it's not as nationally visible as in, as in, as in British college. So my point is, this is still alive and well, despite what, what I mean, Marx, Marx knew it was alive and well. That's why he was castigating it so much. Because he was saying, you're holding up history. You know? And if we can just get rid of those flowers, we don't have to kill so many people. Okay? Not quite explicit as that, but we're putting two centuries together, and that's what happened. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, OK, that's basically pieces of what I've said and published before, but I haven't joined them together until today. So let me stop for a moment for your frank reactions to what, what I've just said here. And I'm sure you've all been exposed to some of this, but um, maybe, not, maybe not quite pulled together the way I have here. And, and what I've also done is include elements here from working with our Chinese, and I've added, I'm trying to bring this in a realistic way. And I've, I've, as I said, we've had about 90 visitors from China. And they are very interested in linking the clear Marxist background to the present. And we're there. And so we are, we are influenced in US media discussions by, by both Marx and Adam Smith in ways that Many, many don't, uh, that, and so I think okay, it's so a part. Comments, questions, Espe I'd say especially for many anyone from Russia or China, or England in terms of the flowers, or the American suburbs of why we don't have more or less. And, and, and um, uh, anything else? Yes? Well, uh I think you're mentioning of the benevolent relationship between the British member and their townspeople reminded me of uh, yeah, the British and their what? Like their bonds people, like their their like people under their control, cavalry control. Like okay. there's a very but benevolent relation that makes this like less like less contentious and more stable. Well, there is a uh, there, there are some views in Chinese intellectual world that the Communist Party actually made some effort to destroy the traditional bonds between like our local landlords and their peasants, and so they like do like impose some ideologies and through like social movement to like change their like the peasants' mind from like their traditional loyalty to their landlords to like the more like class conflict like way of thinking these ways. Okay. Our one of our our Chinese visitors, Bo Chen from Wuhan. Uh, I don't know if you know you know you know you know the name of Bo Chen, maybe not. 
Thank you. He's, he's a research director of the Institute of Culture at the University of Wuhan, and he worked closely with the Ministry of Culture. And he and he has a he made several presentations in classes here when he was here for two years. He basically said, "We have destroyed Chinese traditional culture, especially with Mao and the Cultural Revolution, and that 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 eliminated the legitimacy of traditional." long, you know, 5,000 years of culture without explicitly replacing it with something coherent in a cultural sense. And we need that now. And so working with the Chinese Ministry of Culture, the, the money, the activities are massive. They're far greater than anything in, in the West. They go way beyond the French. And the French state is, has been doing this for several hundred years more actively than, than any other uh, European state. But the Chinese are going much further, <laughs> and, and it's in part with an explicit concern that we need libraries, we need cultural centers, we need museums, but these should be the ac access, these should be accessible in equal manner to all Chinese citizens. Therefore, we should have one of these in every county in China. And there are roughly 3,000 counties and 3,000 9,000 of these institutions across China, equally. So we've been analyzing them. How much do these make a difference? And initially we found they didn't make a difference because you find one everywhere. But if you then try to get measures of how, how many books are taken out, how many performances are there in theaters, how much do people go to the cultural uh, activities, then we find they do have an impact and they attract more younger people, more highly educated people, uh, as we're finding in in other countries of, of the world. So culture matters, local culture matters more, but how much can the culture be local in these institutions remains a big, a big issue of what they call cultural policy in China today. Any, any other comments? Also, I, I'd say from any of our, yeah, okay, yeah. Yes, uh, so I, I think that's the problem of rural and the and so you mentioned how sort of traditional uh, Chinese cultural heritage has been sort of wiped out in a sense in sort of tens decades, and now I think joined with rapid urbanization and sort of the, the opening up and reform, this idea that the rural is less sort of is, is less attractive than the urban because this this trend of a lot of sort of rural migrant workers working in the cities. Um, is, is huge and just talking about sort of, this is almost spring festival in China and the amount of travel that happens between rural and urban is, is actually, it's massive it's a big sort of urban project in a, in a sense in itself and also sort of um, I, I participated in a project of uh, cultural heritage preservation it was in, in a small village in Guangdong and it's it's amazing how when you go to that village there's not very many men uh, very uh, like few men in each household um, and then a lot of women uh, and elderly and their children and the men have all gone to work in the cities in the factories and then a part of big part of the project is to say okay these are sites with enormous cultural heritage and resources that these people are leaving behind and finding ways to make sort of this rural lifestyle more attractive to urbaners and trying to bring these young men back and to work on these is hugely essential. Um, and then I've also sort of noticed this, Chinese students might be aware of this, but uh, a YouTuber uh, in China has been posting some videos about the beauty of countryside uh, and using very elaborate shots and sort of very delicate scenes of beauty and how you make traditional food in, in the countryside. And this has been a huge hit. And actually, uh, the official Chinese um, government Weibo or their social media account, they have acknowledged this as a great way of, say, uh, cultural export or exporting our um, sort of cultural resource or something like that. And that has received a lot of comments, including like saying, okay, this is, this is really good, but is this really what rural life looks like? Is it that delicate and attractive? But some people are saying, okay, this is a really good step because people are watching these videos 
this would I mean there are people talking Chinese in the videos, but there were no captions. But just because how delicate they are and how beautiful and attractive these videos are, people are very attractive sort of all around the world to look at these videos. I can't remember the name of the author, but this is something that's okay. And this, this, this excellent points. The back, one backdrop just for others who may not be so conscious of this or non-Chinese is there are strict differences between rural residents or people born and who've grown up and who have you know sort of a passport identification card which says you are rural. And if you if you leave your rural area and you go to a middle sized or big city or somewhere else, you cannot get certain I mean, what 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 are you denied? Um, educational resources or sometimes healthcare in some in some cases. Um, and then you're kind of looked out upon because <laughs> you're you don't have a uh, hukou and then it makes sort of if you lose your say your ID it's very hard to get it um, recovered because your Google status is not here somewhere else. Okay. So the rural urban differences are not arbitrary and small. They're major and they inform big, you know, huge policies in ways that make China very different from most countries of the world that have this rural urban kind of kind of split. Uh, and Mao was very conscious of these and sensitive to these issues because he was the head in the 1930s, he was the head of the rural division of the Communist Party. And they were considered subordinate, I mean, in terms of Marxist theory, you know, they're the past. But there were battles between the British and, and the urban in several big Chinese cities. And the British basically fought and killed off uh, a number of the urban communist leaders in ways that Mao triumphed over what would have normally been the urban national leadership of the, of the, of the urban leaders. And so rural Chinese became more central through Mao's distinctive personal history, along with, okay, along with more, and then, and then changes, which we do that is. But my point is not to go in, my point is to, to bring in Chinese history just enough that it's important for Sweden, for the American South, for France, that, that these are bigger things in comparative perspective where we can learn more about ourselves in everywhere else, as well as uh, Chinese history. Okay, any other any other comments from any of our we have we have three teaching assistants who have Chinese and I said when when, when I used to have one te smaller classes with just one teaching assistant, I'd try to have someone Chinese. Now we've got three out of four, so we we that, but they, they also they also know a, a lot more than China. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if there Here, here's our, our official your our, our official continental European Swedish voice is speaking up. Now the not can speak on Sweden, but uh, <laughs> I was going to say I was wondering a bit about um, the relationship in England between the landlords slash the elite and um, the farmers um, because how would like the landlords who moved to say Northern Ireland and you know Pick to where to Northern Ireland Northern Ireland and for example like from the British East East uh, Indian Trading Company and stuff like that like I feel like they have a very big presence worldwide and it just sounds like in the description that they're very closely you know they have a close relationship to the farmers but at the same time they're very global in terms of their activities and other that Okay, I mean, good, big, big questions, and, and, and we'll have some of that. That is, one could try to give you a sort of idiosyncratic, historic question that's British specific, but I'm, and rather than trying to go that route, as I'm not a British expert historian, I'll, I'll answer briefly in terms of a neo Marxist interpretation by the leading disciple of. Is here Adorno, Adorno and Horkheimer. Adorno and Horkheimer, so called the Frankfurt School, was <coughs> Jurgen Habermas. Um, and 
uh, <coughs> it was his, it's his big doctor called Habilitation Schrift in, in, in Germany, which we don't have anything like it in the U.S. It's sort of two or three times a normal U.S. Uh, doctor. And, and it's, it's, um, it contrasts the English with the continent. And I think it was written, it was written about the same time as the Barrington Moore uh, book. Barrington Moore. I'll mention as well, some of you may know, may know the name of Theda Scotchpole. Uh, she was a student of Barrington Moore, uh, and so she really applied what he had said to, to Russia and China in, in the battles for taking power more specifically. But this is the bigger background for Barrington Moore. And if we get to Habermas, Habermas um, was, was, was both brilliant, but also under the, uh, under the, 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 the leadership of Adorno and Horkheimer, who were on the one hand strong Marxists when I gave you the quote about Hollywoodization and so forth, but they joined Marx with the symbolic. Adorno himself was a musical composer, he, rather in a very academic kind of music and the Hindemith kind of style, complicated and difficult. So you don't know his name, you don't get from 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 rap songs or things like that at all. And classical music buffs I never heard of Adorno. But but he but he, he wrote his but his main works were on the sociology of music and music theories more generally and he's highly respected in, in, in I mean he's probably the most most brilliant person who worked on that in the twentieth century. Or at least he would say so. Uh, the um, um, what they did, I'm making the point here, was to try to find a, a reconnection between ideas, and, and we don't want to go, go, go too far, but just mention one book, with, the classic book which they did together before Habermas was called The Authoritarian Personality. And that's a theme that we will continue on a cultural level in this course. And in this section and the next section, I want to, I want to bring in the, with Elazar, the rise of individualism, egalitarianism, participation, talk film, and that's one line and that contrasts with authoritarianism, which you get with slavery, you know, with, with um, forcing people to do things uh, with violence or in more military manner. And these are still with us. They are in the, I would suggest in part, in the cultural style of Donald Trump. Populist leaders are trying to have a mixture of these that will make them appeal to distinctive electorates. But where and how to do it is very tricky and subtle, and we're living through this right now, and these are the, but I'm, I'm trying to make explicit that what we're seeing in debates among the Democratic Party and other candidates uh, is, is embedded in what, what we're talking about here. <laughs> okay, back to Habermas. What his original contribution was, was to contrast the British with the continent. And, and what his, his theme was uh, in doing and looking for the symbolic of looking where at what people talked about and did together, he contrasted what they did in British coffee houses and in Parisian or Roman or Berlin coffee houses and salons and courts, royal courts. Uh, <coughs> And the basic answer was the continental political leaders were authoritarian. They did not want open discussion, dissent, challenging, debate, and so forth. Um, by contrast, the English had, and there were, there were something like 5,000 coffee houses in London in, in, I think, in 16, that is, Coffee was imported from Turkey in, in, uh, in, in around, around 1600, so something of that sort. And it took off. It became very popular in, in the European capitals. Uh, <coughs> and not only as the what you would drink, but as an institution where people would gather and talk. And, and on the continent, in general, 
he argued, the model was not the something separate like a coffee house alone. It was the court and it was elegance, but it was, it was small talk. You didn't talk about big political issues or the economy. You would talk about clothes. When I was a student in Paris, I'll skip that for now, but, but basically, you, have, you still have this today, a lot of sensitivity. We have a, we have a smile from our partial Brazilian. That is, the, the, the Brazilians, the Argentines, dress very elegantly, much better than Americans. <laughs> My neighbors in Bronzeville dress better if you control for income than do the Polish, who, who are the majority residents of Chicago. Uh, why? Okay. The, 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 answer, he, the answer that Habermas gives is that the court or the manor house served as models in ways that people wanted to continue a sort of elite, elegant style, but no politics and no challenging of authority. And so you had, uh, take Paris as an extreme case, or Versailles more specifically, Versailles was built as a massive edifice to attract um, Catherine the Great from Russia, the German dukes, people from Vienna would come and say, oh, you know, Versailles, this is the center of the world. This is, this is the most sophisticated. They have fireworks, we have clothes, we have social and romantic intrigues, we have efforts to access the king and so forth. And that's what people wrote about in novels and memoirs and history books and in the conversations at the time. And then when they started having newspapers and newsletters with printing and the like, this is what you, they were led by literary persons. The editors were poets, were essayists and so forth on the continent. So the rise of the modern newspaper was led by the literary people on the continent and by contrast, if we switch to England, so this is now not just my country, but it's a bigger theory. You had people in the coffee houses, and, and so Hegel, Hegel, I mean, sorry, Habermas stresses how these coffee houses started having things like games of, they would, they would drink coffee, they would throw darts uh, at dart boards, they would make bets, they would wager, will your ship come in from, a distant voyage, and I'll, I'll bet you 50 pounds that it will not if you'll give me, I'll, 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 give, I'll give you 50 pounds if, it, if, if, you, if it's your ship comes in, but if you give me, um, seven, just give me 20 pounds if it doesn't. That, I mean, that's how much I'm willing to, to weight the bet. Okay, that kind of betting led to insurance companies, international insurance. It led to the London stock market. It led, led, went, it led to political tracts by John Locke and, and others, where they, these were written to tar talk about and argue about politics in the coffee houses. These could not be printed in Paris or Berlin at the time. And so the English in the 18th, 19th century, 17th, 18th, 19th century, were doing this kind of thing in ways that they did not do, at least to the, certainly to that, to that extent on the continent. That in turn led to, and, and if, if just to have one little footnote as, you're, as, you're, as you mentioned, the, the East India Company. Before the English were there, who was there from Europe? The Dutch. The Dutch. Okay, what did the Dutch have in common with the English here? They had a stock market even before London. Uh, but they both had shared from the Swiss Calvinism. This is the argument in Max Weber and the Pro how many of you read the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism? Okay. A little higher? Okay. I mean it used to be required reading in the USC college, but that looks like many of you have not have, okay, have not but, but basically Max Weber goes into this in detail that the Calvinism led to an egalitarianism and individualism which fostered this kind of activity uh, and made it legitimate and that had a byproduct of generating the modern world with logic and so one could call part of it capitalism but it was also democracy, individualism, uh, bureau bureau huge bureaucracies, 
trading uh, uh, mechanization, etc. Et, et okay, so the point is the Netherlands shared this with the English, and within England, this was especially the, the non conformist churches, which were basically Calvinists, Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, they were called in England and called in the U.S. as well. Uh, and that these led to, um, as you pointed out, some large English landowners going, I would say, more importantly, not just to Northern Ireland, but going to real Ireland, which was part of the United Kingdom in the, in the 18th and 19th century. So they had large tracts of land, and they treated the Irish in a, in a maybe not as well as the English, I, I'm not sure, but basically you get, you get in the 19th century massive anti-English revolts by the Irish, including revolting against local landlords and backing them up. The English military who were there putting down revolts within Ireland, leading to so leading to revolts eventually to Irish independence from, from England. But basically that's what Marx was talking about. So Marx, so Marx, when this was going on, Marx was saying, these Irish working class union leaders, political party people, they have false consciousness because they should be joining and fighting all capitalists. Instead, they're wasting their time on these landowners. Okay. So that, that's a a, a semi-theoretical answer to your more specific question. But, um, that is, I, want to, I wanted to bring in Habermas, and this, is a, this shows how he, he plays an important role here in, in, in offering a clearer answer to that question than, than Adorno or, or the others. Any more on this? Okay. Let's, let's push on. The, uh, the that that's my my that is we we um, Martin Luther King Day is next Monday. Yeah, so yeah. so we, we do not have class on Monday. So, uh, okay, okay. So there's no class Monday. So we'll only have one class. So I'm trying to have roughly part of the class now where I'm going ahead to the next section because we'll only we'll only have class next Wednesday. And the next section is on global and local cultures, how the decline of the welfare state and the rise of civil society varies locally. Okay. The big readings here uh, no, wait, no, wait, have I no 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 I no, 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 sorry I, I skipped the section. Week three, um, globalization, the emergence and diffusion of distinct democratic cultures and institutions. So the, the reading at the top is LSR. Okay, let me say, let me give you the, the short version of, of LSR and then we'll um, link, link it with some more as we go on. Um, Wrote 50 books, half of them are on the history of the Jews, half of them are on political culture. And they are interpenetrating each other um, in very interesting ways that I will elaborate here. So I, I, Start with a simple crude. Oh, no, let me let me let me not go quite quite to that. Okay. The um, the big analytical question of this section is how and why does globalization and related processes lead to the emergence and diffusion of distinct cultures of 
democracy and I'd say anti-democracy, different kinds of, of, of uh, political cultures locally. Where and why do these emerge? And the, the, the simple answer of both Lipset and, and Elazar to, to simplify a little bit um, is, is, is that they, people carry culture and, on their backs. And when you travel, if you are from um, the Roman army, so say you're, 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 from, you're from Umbria in Italy, you carry your view of what life is like in Umbria. I, I talked about the uh, <coughs> um, um, the Polish and the African American Chicagoans. I mean that statement, that kind of labeling, which we especially are used to in Chicago, because we have the most visible, articulate, active, and conflictual, and sometimes ethnic politics in the United States. And including, uh, in this sense, race. I mean, treating race as a political symbol is a, is a way of defining ethnicity, the historical ethnic background of, of um, distinctive movements. <coughs> OK. Um, so Elazar I'm going to introduce here. I'll just, again, to show the generalization and the links with Lipset. Lip Lipset wrote a lot of books, but one of them which probably several, I'll ask for we got two. Two smart Latin, Latin specialists here. How many of you have either read or heard of Lipset and Solari called Elites in Latin America? Heard of that? No. No. Okay. It's me. It's, it is not widely read. But what he what they do did, did and Solari became the president of Brazil. Yeah, he was president of sociologist and president of Brazil. Cardoso was the sociologist president. Okay, so maybe 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 he's not president. I'm thinking, but Solari, Solari was Brazilian, wasn't he? I think so. Okay, now maybe maybe I'm confused. Um, we can look. At, anyway, they study together all the Latin American countries, including Mexico and Puerto Puerto Rico, which they brought in for contrast, and they did surveys of students in universities, and they asked them about. What did you feel is the good way? Uh, how do you, what do you want to, well, first, what do you want to study? And the, the political elites and culturally oriented folks who were going to law school. And, they want, and their ideal was the old Spanish ideal. They wanted to have a hacienda with horses. They wanted to be in the countryside. They wanted to lead a grand life as a gentleman. They wanted to be elegant. They didn't want to work too hard, and maybe not very much at all if they could do it. Okay, that's an ideal which is not unique to Spain or to Latin America. But the, the point of Lipset and Solari is this was carried by the Spanish conquistador, and it was strongest today in the surveys in Colombia. And Colombia has had some of the most difficult civil wars of any country in Latin America. And, and you know today in the, in the mayoral cabinets of Bogota how many of the individuals were me members of the original conquistador families and which were not. You don't know that in Mexico or Puerto Rico. They had revolutions and then they had egalitarian blending of families, so they, they don't know that, they don't see this as a salient issue the way it was in Colombia. Brazil and Argentina, Chile, big countries that were very economically successful, were not successful because these Hacienda guys got dirty. They had new, and this is the theory, new immigrants who were more lower status, middle and lower status, who were Greek, Italian, Spanish, Jewish in the mid 19th century, and they went to Rio, uh, Sao Paulo, and Japanese as well, uh, and they and China, some Chinese, and, and built up a an active international economy, exporting from Argentina and Brazil successfully. But you have today these conflicting cultures, which are not unique to Brazil or Argentina. They're shared in contrasting 
that is, I didn't mention it, but the, the manor house and in England and Versailles share with the hacienda the aristocratic gentlemanly style that we shouldn't work too hard. We can write poetry and, and sketch flowers, but work is not what you should talk about. Read the novels of Stendhal. You have no idea what people do, how they support themselves. They don't talk about work at all. Okay. Uh, it's improper. Okay. Um, all right. So with this as background, Elazar theorizes all of this. Uh, and, but starting with the idea that different people would carry these, these cultures on their backs, and, <coughs> and the two key past civilizations, in a sense, using that word more generally, <coughs> were the ancient Greeks and the ancient Israelites, um, who created, to simplify, Western civilization. They only, the, the ancient Greeks only were really important, really major. The, the big names were mainly in about 100 years, less than 100 years. Plato, Aristotle, Sophocles, these people all lived together in just a short period of time. So earlier you had Homer and some of the others, but, but Greek civilization was not a long. That is, they were soon conquered by Alexander the Great, as there were other countries that had bigger militaries that, that, that fought bigger, and the small communal style that, were, that was treasured um, by, by some of the, by the smaller Greek models were crushed militarily. <laughs> um, the Israel, Israelites, the, the uh, Israelis, whatever, the, the ancient Jews, <laughs> were, were conquered again and again and again. They were scattered. We had, but the, my, my, the basic point is, these were not territorially based and strongly embedded in, in, in you know, blood and soil, as the Germans used to say. <laughs> they were diaspora ideals. And they, they are found in the American South and black churches when people can recite this, these lines of Jericho and the Bible and where you have in American street music, or say American music from Elvis Presley, his early, I mean, he had recordings of all kinds, what his early work was all gospel music. It was black music, which he learned in the church before he moved to his dancing stuff, he was doing church music. Same thing with most of the, of the, of the top rappers, many African-American singers of various sorts. They've learned this from, and, uh, <coughs> so for instance, um, um, Michael Jackson, uh, the Jacksons, I mean, et cetera, et cetera, I mean, basically, the, 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 the point is, there are elements of these traditions which then got fused, um, such as monotheism, linked to the idea of progress in contrast to the cyclical views of history which were found in most of the polytheistic civilizations which worshipped many gods in their natural habitats. habitats. Um, So, uh, just to, I'll put, I'll put two things on the board, then, then, then let you, and let, you can read more, and then let's have a little bit of discussion. Two things on the board are, uh, <laughs> the concept of the, of the covenant, the core concept of democratic, democratic, Constitutions, law, thinking, and most of all, culture uh, for Elazar came when Moses went on the mount and met with God, and God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. He brought them back to the people and said, we must live by the Ten Commandments that God gave to me directly. And this is our constitution. This is our law. If you then, then what Elazar did was to study the constitutions of little t 
towns where the English first arrived in, 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 in Portsmouth, Massachusetts, Newburyport, Boston, Salem, and so forth, and all those constitutions have the same thing. You see, you know, we are, we, we, we are happy to have reached, you know, we, you know, we crossed this ocean, we are creating a new future city, and we were town or state and so forth, and, and we are with God. We say we will follow the Ten Commandments, and this is how these apply in our specific lives and laws. Don't jaywalk. Don't, you know, don't steal, etc. You go to Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, nothing like that. No covenant, no God. They were founded by the versions of the Dutch and the English trading companies, the East India Tea Company, for profit. Uh, the covenant, so the covenant image, or a covenant society, as Elzelder will put it, informs the view of what's right or wrong in government and in life, uh, with religion as a, as a model of the proper core, but <coughs> it is a moralistic conception of politics and of life, that you must, you must live this way or you will, you will be a sinner, and that's worse than disobeying the law. Okay, so that but where so you get this the strongest version in that biblical conception, you get it in <clears throat> the most most visible are parts of northern Germany, Iceland, the either Iceland uh, religious ceremonies that reenact some of reenact some of this over the 19th and into the uh, in, up, up more or less up to up, up to present. Okay, point one, point two. So I'll come to yeah, you. Okay. Um, point two, just things for you to take away and to read about more. This is the United States. Okay. Um, basically, we have uh, New England, the Middle Atlantic, and the South. And there were three migration streams. They came from the same parts of England. They were all Southern England. They were the same ethnic group. They were all roughly similar in education and income and so forth. But these people were nonconformists. These were the these were Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, <laughs> and uh, and they created the not they didn't call it the state. They called it the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which is its name today. The sense of the Commonwealth that we share goods together. That we must preserve them leads to support for the environment, for, for women's rights, for etc. A strong egalitarianism, which you do not have in the market-oriented Middle Atlantic settled by, this was initially New Amsterdam, renamed New York. Wall Street is there, along with um, uh, a migration of similar people who went, who went there and more market-oriented. And in the South, you had a hierarchical system based on, and I mentioned the shoemaker, but the shoemaker was often someone who was then called, he was white initially, but he was an indentured servant. He'd stolen a knife or a plate, and he, and he was given five years punishment as an indentured servant, after which he could become free. But for those five years, he could be sold to someone else, and he could be sold to someone who bought him and said, okay, you're coming with me, to, uh, to, to Virginia because we need someone who knows how to uh, shoe horses. <clears throat> okay, so these, these three traditions then migrated west across the U.S. So we have today three political cultures that conflict, conflict with one another. And that's, they're going on with the themes in our political party candidates, but these are not simply left and right. These are deeper and more fundamental. Okay, I'll, I'll end there, read on, but let's have, we got, we got just a couple of minutes of discussion on, on any of this to get us started. And you can, yeah, it's appropriate that we will have Martin Luther King Day in the middle because we'll talk about Luther and Lutheranism as part of this in the phases uh, next Wednesday. But who else, who else has a, a, anyone have a comment or question there? You look very puzzled. You don't have, you don't get this talk to you in, in Brazilian history, but you've lived in the South. So. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh,
Some of you are looking puzzled. That's fine. I mean, I, I want to puzzle you enough that you'll you'll read right over Martin Luther King Day. And when you see some see, when you when you read or you see any any popular coverage of Martin Luther King and, and his meaning, you try to disentangle what are people saying today? How is this making people talk and think differently? And why? Yeah. Specifics and then going up. Yes. So, and different cross national differences based on this. Yes. So, can you, are you defining culture as essentially an aesthetic idea? Or how, how can culture be? Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about that more as, as, we, as we go along. Um, I, I'd say, if, and you look at some of it in the lip set, in the lip set, and look, look, look at the readings that are out there. How is our, and, but, and, what, what, and I, would, I would answer, I don't have an original definition. I'm using culture as the same as political culture and sociologists and political science have used. Values, norms, and the related specific roles and in institutions that come from those, like bureaucracy. Yes? Yeah, uh, kind of along that, those lines. Uh, I know we talked about uh, 1989, previously. I feel like the earlier part of the lecture connected to that, uh, you know, you, you mentioned before, like, Russia democratized in 1989 without war. Um, and I recently read an article on Durkheim about collective effervescence and dangerous uh, charisma. And I was wondering, like, the article argues that it was a local process. It was like both, like, student intellectuals and group all the workers kind of coming together uh, that were able to mobilize. It was kind of like the grassroots mobilization. In, in Moscow or in Berlin? Uh, in, in Moscow. Moscow. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a, I mean, I'm not a specialist. I mean, I've, I've heard there are many interpretations. And so uh, I'm, I think the, the, the simple answer is clearly multi-causal. Um, but that it, it was associated with many of the other factors that we're going to cover in the course, which are not which were not unique to, to Russia in that sense. And we could look at we could look at uh, another in a sense a test and more generalizations to say where and why do we have support for different kinds of elements of democracy defined in various ways in China today? Because we have different parts of Chinese society that are more open or more hierarchical as we do in France or in the US. Yeah. What about that? The, uh, or, or Latin America. That concept though, the idea of kind of bringing people together, like we're talking about culture, sort of this in Egypt, at least in Asia, um, to mobilize for something. It brings people together, but, but I'd say the critical point is not togetherness or networks. That is network analysis, especially in sociology, is really a methodology. It shows how people are linked, but it doesn't say what links them. What gives them a sense of identity and connectiveness that makes it powerful? Would you say that's where religion comes in? Uh, in relig in, yes, and religion is sort of the, the template of much, of much cultural analysis. We ought to, we ought to quit now as we're, we're, we're past our official time. But thank you for your, for your good questions. And we will pursue them uh, after Martin Luther King Day, which illustrates much of what I said. Okay. Thank you.